How's it going, ladies and boys? It's up over six kilo. Welcome back to Sekamaya. Back into Shiroya's uh, mind so that we can see the events play out uh, the way they did for her, or perhaps an alternate version of her. Whatever. Let's let's just get into it, shall we? I mean, it's, it's been a long enough series already without my starting spiels and ending spiels. Oh, the lights do work. Yeah. The four smaller lights were functioning again. However, that can be taken as confirmation of anything since Katai had been the one to suggest checking them. Without saying anything else, Sai walked to the other hallway. Strangely, he went straight to the event room. Why did you come here? So Katai doesn't see me. Nonchalantly, he put his hand onto Atsuki. Out to his put out his hand to Atsuki. Do you want the keys? Precisely. Why? To unlock the cabinet. What's the point? It can be dangerous for the second mile. Let's not cause problems we can avoid. I want to touch it though. And there should be no problem with that. You said Nami was going to let you do it, but Katai made sure nobody would touch it. You'll understand he's been lying, don't you? And the Sekimaya was brought to the attic. Either by him or Naomi. The two people who should have known a higher temperature could be damaging. That's pretty suspicious, right? I bet he exaggerated the need for the temperature so we wouldn't get it out. However, he took it out himself earlier and brought it to the attic. You don't think it was Naomi? The key ring that Atsuki has might be hers. Katai had to lie and say that he had an identical one. That means it's pretty unlikely she was the one to move the second mile. So she probably can't access the attic at the moment. However, there was one thing I find incredibly strange, and I'm not sure why Katai hasn't tried to excuse it. A few minutes ago, he made you lock the attic, claiming he didn't want anyone entering it without his knowledge. Now, he said he was going to manually lock this cabinet so that nobody could open it. But he didn't ask for the keyring to let Atsuki keep it. And let Atsuki keep it. It's just plain contradictory, and not something we, he would ignore. You're actually right, he should have made sure to keep it for himself after locking the attic. Which leads me to a single conclusion. Katai is, to put it lightly, of low intelligence. He might be just working with Naomi, who has an identical set of keys, locking the attic, and this cabinet must have been done to give Naomi a way out. She can still unlock both locks, and by letting Atsuki keep the keys, he'll always be a possible suspect for Naomi's actions. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. He must know how hard to believe it is that the keyring Atsuki has isn't Naomi's, and has taken advantage of that to make us think only Atsuki can use it. Sounds like you made up the Sekimaya, that the Sekimaya had to be kept here for a reason, right? It was in the attic, and nothing happened to it. Atsuki walked forward, unlocking the cabinet with a key, and scrolled open the glass. The compartment is definitely kept very cold. It hardly matters, take it out. There's something I'm especially curious about. Atsuki sighed and looked at the useless camera that wasn't recording him. With both hands, he grabbed the cushion and took it out. Then he placed it on top of the cabinet, with the Sekimaya resting in the middle. He stepped back. Katai made it clear he didn't want us to touch it, so Atsuki didn't lay a hand on it himself, and simply allowed Sai to do so if he wished. Of course, nothing's happening to it. This is a bad idea, Sai. Nobody was sure why he'd push back against Katai's order so much, but Isla walked up to the cabinet and tried to reach the second mile with her arm. You are here. I haven't been a... What the hell? What are you doing? Seeing his expression, Isla dashed away before Katai ran to the cabinet. I said how many times how many times how important nobody cut him off but the sentence never finished whoa what the fuck we'd all seen the same thing Katai had run toward the second mile and made to grab it then his entire figure had vanished from the room at the same time the second mile returned gray as if reacted to Katai's it reacted to Katai's touch so that's interesting so Katai was the first one to travel in time or space or whatever this time whereas last time it was us Atsuki while we exchanged speechless looks, we saw Arkado staring through the hallway A door. What the fuck did you just do? We approached it and saw Katai in the hallway, close to the security room. Atsuki was in much of a disbelief as the rest of us. I thought I must have missed something, but Sly's question confirmed we'd all interpreted it the same way. Did this man just teleport? Like ours, Katai's eyes lacked comprehension, and he only let out some words second after the minimal echo had faded away. I just... Traveled to the past. What? Travel to the past? Is that what we're supposed to believe? Nobody could accuse Katai of a trick, as we'd all seen him disappear. He was breathing heavily and he started to move his arms, checking that his body worked as usual. I know how it sounds, but that's what it felt like. No, what the hell just happened? It did feel like I went back a few seconds to when I was walking from the security room to the event room. He slowly returned to the event room and stared at the second mile, which had changed colours. 
This thing is dangerous. Did it darken when I touched it? I know I felt it burning. While well, nobody answered, he approached it and put it inside the cabinet with its cushion, avoiding direct contact with it. What the hell? It turned white again. Did you know this would happen? What? Of course. This is why you insisted that we couldn't get the second wire out of its cabinet. That we shouldn't touch it. And it's why you never touched it directly when you brought it down. What are you talking about? I'm as confused as you are. As he spoke, he manually locked the cabinet. I believe I made a mention of that in the last episode. How he used his sleeve to to hold the second wire so he didn't touch it. Which inferred that he already knew what it was capable of. That thing just made you teleport out of the room. And either you or Naomi brought it to the attic. You knew what it would do. That's why the fucking footprints were so weird. Like someone had disappeared right in front of the second wire. The conversation began to sound utterly surreal. But Sai was making sense. That the second wire had really teleported Kutai and recontextualized a few things. What are you even accusing me of? I touched it and instantly found myself in the hallway. I have no clue how it happened. I can't even believe what I'm saying. I couldn't help but agree with Sai. Kutai had rushed to the second wire as soon as he'd seen it above the cabinet, and he touched it with his own skin and his panic despite his previous caution on the top floor. I came around after hearing voices to inform me that I hadn't been able to power the computer back on. And unbelievable as it seemed, it sounded like he was trying to change the subject. I still have more things to try though. I know I've repeated myself quite a few times, but it's clear now that the second mind must be kept here. You said it made you travel to the past, but you're just going to ignore that? I know I don't want to try it again. Whatever might have really happened, I have very little information about the second mind. This is no ordinary gem, as expected. It has to stay here until the shutter opens. There's no way it isn't dangerous, and the cold temperature must be keep must keep it stable in some way. I wasn't given any information on why it's essential, but now we might know more about it. So, we come back to the same point. We must find her. He walked toward us, then toward hallway A. If I manage to power the computer and cameras back on, that'd be the best way to find her. Then he walked to the security room and left our field of vision. What the fuck? He did it again. Does he think we're idiots? He walked away from the stone that made him teleport and didn't demand the keys. You're right, yeah. If he wanted to keep it locked in his cabinet, he would have made sure to keep the keys himself. He's definitely working with Naomi. Whatever it is, he isn't being truthful in the slightest. Unlock it again. Of course, after all that Katai had said, we could just take the Sekimaru out of the cabinet again, and it was fairly stupid to think that we wouldn't. Without thinking about it, Atsuki undid Katai's lock. He opened the glass and once again took out the cushion holding the Sekimaru. The gemstone had gone back to glowing white, but Atsuki didn't place it anywhere. He looked at it curiously, with both of his hands occupied. What? Did we touch it? Most of us looked skeptical or even embarrassed to try. Sai, who I'd imagine be the first to attempt it, appeared hesitant. We were staring at the second mo, when in an instant the opposite door had become our focus. From behind the shut door to hallway B came a sound we had confirmed we had to confirm we heard. Naomi? It has to be her. We got closer to the door and Arkado opened it. The hallway was empty, but it contained many doors none of us had yet entered. It came from pretty close to the door, but she must have hidden already. Was she listening and ran away when she realised what she'd heard? She'd been heard, sorry. We left the way, the way to the lobby open, but if Nami had been sneaking up on us, it was possible she closed herself behind one of the multitude of doors we could see. If that was the case, we finally had a chance to confront her. We hadn't yet inspected the whole crystal floor, and we still had to locate her. The second wire rolled slightly on top of the cushion, which Artsky laid on the floor next to him. Meanwhile, the rest of us opened door after door and briefly looked through each room. All the crystal rooms were empty and midway we noticed that some of the cabinets could be opened to reveal spacious interiors. The staff room contained numerous lockers we couldn't open, and the small clearing room had several cleaning products. The small cleaning room had several cleaning products, a large cart and some buckets. In the end, we hadn't found anyone in hallway B or in the bathrooms. But we knew we'd heard a person, and we didn't stop there. While Atsuki continued looking through hallway B, we went down to the mechanical room, which was empty and somewhat foreboding. Katai was kneeling under the desk in the security room. We quietly ignored him and searched through hallway A's rooms. Again, every crystal room was identical, except for the one that had been hit by the smoke. Like the storeroom though, it was empty. We knew that Naomi had been very close to us, but we'd failed to find her. We had to and we had to prioritize the second mile before extending the search to the higher floors. Exasperated, we returned to see Atsuki waiting on the spot where we'd last seen him. On the floor with the cushion, with the cushion and the second mile, when it was clear that we hadn't found anyone, he looked at them. 
Remove the smell from the attic? Might have come from the second wire. I started noticing it here some time ago. Oh, huh. I'm gonna touch it. I felt slight traces of tension for a second. Was it really possible he was about to travel through time? I didn't think I could really take that seriously, but seeing him about to try made me uncomfortable. It was almost laughable how all of us looked on in anticipation, trying to confirm whether we'd lost our minds or not. His hand got closer and closer to the gem until no distance separated it from him. As he touched it, he was instantly no longer touching it. Atsuki was gone and the Sekimaru turned grey. Ow! Oh. Everybody else was occupied with the realisation the Sekimaru's powers were real, but I ran forward knowing I'd heard another sound coming from hallway B. The door wasn't fully closed, so I opened it all the way. I heard a sound just as Atsuki disappeared, and I knew someone was there. The instant I peeked around it, I saw him. Hesitated, hesitatingly glancing from hallway C was Atsuki, whose eyes pierced mine until he removed himself from behind the corner. Slowly he began to walk up to me as I wondered what to say. So it worked? You went to the past? Um, yes, I suppose so. I can't... I can't believe it though. Everyone else was petrified, containing their sheer shock. But I noticed some, that someone who should have been there was missing. Is Sai not here? Oh, you're right. I don't think he's been here for a bit. How's that possible? I don't get it. But if you went to the past, why didn't you appear in this room? That's what happened to Katai. Hmm. I don't think I traveled a few seconds through time, but actually minutes. About 20 I'd say. Oh what? That long ago? He was still in the attic, right? Doesn't make sense though, like, because Katai just activated it. It shouldn't have recharged that much yet. Atsuki nodded, clearly dis disconcerted. We could only look at the second eye, which was a different colour than it should have been. Let me see. He crouched again and placed his hand on it. It's not doing anything and it's cold. It must not do anything when it's this colour. It's just a thought, but maybe I travelled further because it spent more time out of the cabinet. When Katai touched it, it had barely been out for any time at all. Oh, okay, I guess it has been out for a while. He grabbed the cushion with both hands and walked to the cabinet. Mere seconds after he put it back in place, the second mile started glowing again. This again. We could only stare in confusion as he closed the glass. The key ring, key ring had been left in the keyhole, so he took it out before thinking about how to phrase what he wanted to say. I still can't believe what just happened to me, but I think we should go along with what Katai said and leave it in this cabinet until we can leave. I frowned a little while he locked the cabinet with, his, with the wheel. He held out his arm and to hand me the key ring, which I put in my purse without question, even though it confused me. I mean, what else would we do? Atsuki didn't answer, but I imagined the way he'd internally responded to that question. A few days ago I'd heard the words, I wish I could go back in time, coming out of his mouth. I couldn't believe he was actually going to casually leave the second mile locked away. Ideally, that would have been great. I'd been expecting a much different reaction, and I couldn't discard it entirely. He could have easily been trying to fool the others by giving the keys to me. No one spoke up, probably only thanks to the fact that Sai wasn't around. Akiro had indicated that he wasn't in hallway A either, so he might not have been nearby. Did you make the sound in hallway B early? Oh yeah, I did. That was when I realised I'd really travelled through time. I moved to the second floor fast enough to stay out of sight. That's just insane. Were we actually searching for you? Where the hell is Nami then? We stepped into gloomy hallway A. Actually, where is Sai? That's another good question. I know he was with us when we searched this hallway. Did he go somewhere? Annoyed, Arkado rapidly glanced through the doors. He's not here. Did you see what happened to him? He directed that question at Atsuki, who'd gone several minutes to the past and remained hidden. No, I was on the second floor, so all I know is that he didn't go up. He's still here then. Faint sounds had been coming from the security room, where Katai was. To confirm that he was alone, we walked up to the door. We could see him leaning back on the chair in defeat due to all the screens still being black. Oh, I haven't been able to fix anything. I apologise. I'm completely lost. I don't even know what the issue is. Everything is properly arranged and connected, so unless no electricity is reaching the outlets, I'm out of ideas. He crouched and crawled under the desk, failing to realise that Sai wasn't with us. We approached him and silently stared, while he kept repeating how confused he was from the floor. And you still haven't found Naomi. You were inspecting this floor just now, right? Yes, she wasn't here. That's very strange. She might have been able to keep dodging us, but there's no way that'll work for too long. There's no place where she could hide forever. He crawled out and let himself fall back into the chair, looking exhausted. Behind him, all of us kept silent. We were all digesting the fact that time travel had occurred right in front of us, but it didn't seem like Katai had found that particularly relevant, as he only looked concerned about his computer. 
I noticed that Atsuki had remained by himself next to the door. I wouldn't have approached him if I hadn't seen him curiously staring into the distance. Is there anything... Oh, the elevator! As soon as I glanced at the hallway seat, I could see that the elevator's door was very slightly open. It's not closed, yeah. What? Akado approached us with a frown, but Katai addressed it before he got too before he got far. Well, it's been like that for a while. I noticed it when we walked down from the attic and figured the others had purposely left it like that. We didn't. It must not have been have closed properly when you got off then. I've seen it happen in the past. Hmm, I see, I didn't notice it. Me neither. Wait, I just remembered the hallway B camera. The one that had its lens completely clean. Going by their looks, Akado and Katai didn't know what I was talking about. Excuse me? Right, the one above the door to the lobby. Yeah, it's footage is being displayed up there. Are you serious? Both of them hurried out of the room, while the rest of us awkwardly stayed put. Isla, clinging to her mother's legs, had become a little more relaxed. She curiously looked around. Time travel evidently not much of a weight on her mind. During the silence, I approached the computer. I was a little curious about its mysterious shutdown, but I didn't examine it very thoroughly. It didn't take the others very long to come back. You saw it, right? What the hell, was it cleaned? There's no way we could know. We all looked at Katai, he put his hand in a deep pocket of his, but took it back out empty. I don't have it anymore. But do you remember when... Wait, where the hell's Sai? After looking at each other, we let him know we'd recently lost track of Sai. Before Katai could get too alarmed, Akado cut in. What were we gonna say? We've already searched for Sai and the second is locked in the cabin. The duct tape, remember? So I took it out of my key room, and it had a piece of duct tape attached to it. That piece had smoke residue on it. We all remembered what he was talking about and began to understand why he brought it up. I know it was duct tape because one side was still sticky, which means it was only hit on the front side. In other words, it was stuck somewhere when the smoke was released. Where'd it even come from? When I walked down to the crystal floor searching for you, I found it hidden behind a handrail and put it in my pocket to inquire about it. That's when it got stuck to the key room. So it was placed on the lens of that camera which prevented the smoke from hitting it. Afterwards, it was removed. I'm confused about a few things. Why would someone do that? It must have been someone who knew the smoke attack would happen, and it was removed before we entered the security room. Additionally, leaving it behind a handrail seemed strange, but they wanted to throw it away, flushing it through the toilet seemed, seemed ideal, as fingerprints could otherwise present a problem. That logic led to the thought that Katai, who might have orchestrated the whole thing, could have placed the duct tape himself and kept it in his pocket, unaware that it would be found. I opted not to speculate about that out loud, and let everyone else come to the conclusions they wanted. In the end, Katai sighed and sat on his chair again. What the hell is Naomi doing? You can't even use the computer to figure anything out. Do you all think Sai ran away on his own? Now we need to find both of them. We lost track of him when we were searching the hallway, which would, would have been a good opportunity to sneak away. I have no idea why he'd do that then. Once again, Katai pressed the computer's power button in frustration, while looking at all the powered off screens. Maybe now you can believe that he was the one who was up to something? I'm just trying to do my job. Whether they believed him or not, nobody spoke up for a while. Even if two people had travelled through time, we all had our own reasons to keep still in the narrow room, prioritising internal thoughts before going out to find the two missing people. We were still behind Katai's chair, awaiting any decision, when noise came from the door. As we turned around, we saw Sai staring at us next to the unassertive Atsuki. Where were you? Me? I just took a detour to the bathroom. Katai's smirk perfectly conveyed his reaction, but Sai ignored it. Instead, he slipped into the room. So, what are we doing here? You still can't fix your own computer? What do you think? I think we just found out that we can travel to the past, and instead of trying to fix a computer, wouldn't it be a better idea to travel back in time and see who did this? You really can't expect us to take you seriously. Sai, like, what were you doing just now? You definitely weren't in the bathroom. Did you check all of them? You have to give up on him. Whether it was, whatever he was doing will be exposed eventually. Anyway, who has the keys now? I have them. I see, is there a reason why we're here? No, we should try to find Naomi again. That's what I'm saying. As Sai left the room, we all exchanged looks, wondering what his intentions really were. We began to disperse into hallway A behind him. Atsuki hadn't yet moved from the door and his expression had gotten considerably murkier. I had no idea what it meant anymore, so I walked up to him. Is it going better? Huh? Sorry, I don't know. I just can't believe it. I really travelled through time. Well, I can't believe it either. Are you sure you don't want to do it again? What? 
Travel through time? Yeah. No, no, of course I do. I'm trying to understand some things. I traveled a few minutes to the past, to the attic, which might make sense. I'm not sure if that's enough, though. Oh, I see. He didn't seem to even notice my reply. Since he'd gone quiet again, I walked away slowly. When Sai saw that, he approached me and spoke in a hushed tone, so his words reached only my ears. You think Artsky's hiding something, right? What? You definitely know him, but you realized something he said didn't make sense. What the hell are you talking about? Am I wrong? He traveled to the past of the second mile, that much I know. Then he simply reunited with you guys. Am I missing something? N no. What are you getting at? If I'm not missing anything, I don't know. However, he is hiding something, and apparently even from you. I'm sure he'll want to use the second mile again. So if he doesn't tell you that, assume that he's lying and try to stop him. Trying his best to sound mysterious, Sai walked away. The two most suspicious people inquired about Artsky, and once again, I could only laugh inwardly as I sighed outwardly. Try to stop him. They didn't need to tell me that, but I wouldn't do anything. In any case, given that I'd been told the same thing again, it was very possible Artsky was trying to pull something off. If Naomi's really hiding, we'll never find her in one if we go in one group. Let's disperse ourselves through the building. There's no way we'll miss her if we do that. What a good idea. In the blink of an eye, Artsky and I were the only remaining people in Hallway A. Isla had dragged Edna to the, into a crystal room. Arkado had disappeared off to Hallway C, and Sai and Katai had gone up the stairs individually. Despite sharing a common objective, there'd be no coordination and everyone had silently chosen their own path to take. We were left a little puzzled, as everyone had walked away from the Sekamai, which only I could take out of the cabinet. Had it been because Artsky had told us he didn't want to use it? I could not exactly ask anyone. Well, what do we do? You're asking me? I don't know, I'm just tired. Me too. You've been awake longer though. I know. I suppose we could go to the attic. You have the key, right? Yeah, but we probably shouldn't go in alone. And splitting it to find Naomi won't work if half of us stay. still stay. I'm not sure it would work anyway. If the exit's as close as the, al exit closes, the alarm went off, and she's hiding somewhere. She must be confident she won't be found. And if she's working with Katai, he's definitely confident we won't find her. We've already been everywhere in this building, so I don't think it's essential that we keep looking for her. If she can be found, it'll happen eventually. What do you want then? I want to go to the attic. I need to lie down for a bit. We've been told not to enter without Katai's consent, but he'd been the one to let us keep the keys. I hesitated, but I had no reason to object, so I just shrugged and headed over to the elevator. I noticed something had changed when I reached for the handle. The door's not open anymore. Oh yeah, it was earlier, so I used it. That makes sense. And it's still here. There was no resistance when I tried to open the door, meaning the side must have gotten off on the crystal floor. Artsky nodded before stepping in. I took the keyring from my purse and inserted the attic key into the first keyhole. The light around the floor, seven button activated, and after pressing it, we began to ascend. I didn't know what to think of Artsky, but we were at least getting far away from the second mile, which felt as strange as everyone else having left. With dull eyes, he stared at the door until the trip ended, and just wished we'd gone to sleep the previous night. I felt a little uncomfortable stepping onto the wooden floor, aware that cameras might have been about to record us. That sensation didn't seem to be shared by Artsky, who directly approached the living room. Doesn't look like anyone else has been here. Plenty of footprints were still visible, and I figured Artsky knew that they were the same ones we'd seen before leaving. Hey, hasn't the smell from earlier faded away a lot? Oh, I think you're right. I'm so exhausted. Even if we shouldn't be here, at least nobody will, be bothering, will bother us, assuming Naomi really can't get in. He walked down the hallway, sighing deeply. After choosing to open the right door, I heard him falling onto the bed. I entered the room and recalled that there was only one bed. He was already lying face down, all energy drained out of him. I stood by the door for a moment and then closed it after stepping in. I could have gone to the neighbouring room, but I decided to go to the upper level instead. There I shakily sat on one of the beds, finding my situation unnerving. My whole body was stiff, and my mind felt numb. After a while I managed to lie down and the mattress reminded my body how tired it was. I didn't fight the tiredness. Under foreign bed sheets, recorded by a camera on that forbidden floor, I pushed my consciousness away until it dissipated. When I woke up, I realized I must not have slept for very long, as it didn't feel like I had dreamed at all. I was still uneasy, and I hadn't turned off the light. I didn't know the time. It was fairly likely the people were looking for us and couldn't get in the attic. I didn't care anymore, my back hurt, 
I was just as tired as before. I slowly stood up and approached the light switch. But my hand stopped before touching it and so did my whole body. Did I just do this? I noticed something very important next to the bed. There was only one thing I'd done before falling asleep. Look at my purse. I stared at it and then forced myself to look away, nervous that it was so out in the open. Because if I'd fallen asleep, someone could have looked inside and that was something that couldn't happen. I crouched very slowly and then looked at it from the same position as before. It moved. It wasn't like that when I fell asleep. The difference was minimal, but I'd noticed it immediately, and it was no mistake. No. Did he? Or did I just poke it when I stood up? I widened the opening with my fingers and looked inside. Everything's here. Nothing had been taken, but that didn't settle it. The keys were inside. If someone had gone through my purse, it was very likely those keys had been the target, but they were far from my concern. Artsky and I should have been alone in the attic, which had both of its entrances locked. I suddenly wasn't sensing my tiredness anymore. I grabbed my purse and approached the hatch. It was shut, so I slowly lifted it up. Are you awake? Uh, yes. I only slept for a few minutes and couldn't do it again. How do you know it was only a few minutes? Huh? It's just what it felt like. Did you just wake up? It took a few, I took a few seconds to reply when I climbed down the ladder. The light was turned on and the sheets over him were in disarray. Yeah, I don't know how long it's been. It's been a very long time trying to sleep again, so... I think at least two hours. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. And I don't think it'll happen. Are you still tired? No, I'm fine now. I see. I felt as if part of my mind had cleared up. We'd seriously gotten trapped in the building. And Artsky had travelled through time. Could that be true? Could that really have happened? He sat on the bed and stretched his arms. It was so absurd that I hadn't been able to react when I'd seen him teleport. It had all suddenly happened with no chance of doubt. But what was going on? Only after waking up had I begun to comprehend how strange it was that he wanted to go to the attic. Did you hear anything outside the bedroom? No. We might really have the only key to this place. Since I didn't want to ask, I approached the door. The chain wasn't set, so I turned the handle to see if he'd locked it. The door opened smoothly, indicating that anyone could have made their way in. Did you want to go back down? I was waiting for you to wake up. I'm not as tired anymore. Yeah, sure. Was it being toyed with? The more seconds passed, the more I felt that way. Hatsuki stood up and silently walked to the hallway. Nobody crossed this floor. I can hardly see the footprints anymore. You have the key with you, right? Yeah. Well, you should probably use the elevator again, so I don't think we'll need it. He tried to open the door, but he couldn't. I suppose someone must have called it while we were sleeping. I leaned on the wall while he pressed the button. I was acting disinter disinterested naturally, but I couldn't get the side of my purse out of my head. The silent orange light indicated that the elevator had arrived. Artsky dragged the door open, and we walked in. The elevator began to descend toward the lowest floor, the destination that Artsky had chosen. I guess we'll have to apologise for going up, but we were really tired. I wonder if they found Naomi. Artsky was resembling Katai more and more to me. I didn't know if I could trust him. Behind him was the red stop button. Katai had said that pressing it would confine us inside until the alarm's effects automatically disabled. But I didn't dare touch it, allowing the doors to open. After Artsky pushed open the outer one, Bullway C came to sight, as barren as we remembered it. Let's go to the security room. Maybe we can look at the time. The light was on, but no screens were. That meant the size watch was still all we had. It hasn't been fixed. I can't hear anyone, but they should be somewhere on this floor. Artsky was ready to leave, but I couldn't help but feel iffy about the computer's shutdown. Katai had been the only one to try and fix it. Since we were alone, I crouched under the desk and stared at the mess of cables that Katai had been examining. Uh, after glancing back and forth, an oddity stood out. Can you even properly see down there? Yes, and this cable wasn't plugged in. Huh? I don't know what it's for, but Katai said that everything was in place. Can you tell where it should be going? The egg was uncomfortable on my neck, but I strained to look behind the computer tower and found a slot that it could fit. Having to use my left hand, I grabbed the cable and managed to plug it into the computer. I don't know if it did anything, but it's plugged in now. I clamped it out as Artsky pressed the power button. A few seconds later, the system began to run. Are you serious? The middle screen lit up and the loading logo glowed. I don't get it. Did Katai do this and hope he wouldn't look at the cables? I began to gather hope, but it dissipated as soon as the computer turned off again. Huh. Is it still not working? Confused, Artsky powered it on one more time. The same thing happened. Seconds after running, it automatically powered off. Artsky looked under the desk in case he could spot the problem. 
I don't see anything clearly wrong. Maybe the operating system got damaged. I see. We need to tell the others about this, especially Katai. Right. We were about to leave when Atsuki removed what I'd said. Oh wait. We still might be able to look at the time. It's in the BIOS. He walked back to the computer and powered it on. While it was running, he looked at the screen and pressed one of the suggested keys. Then the screen changed. I just accessed the BIOS. If I knew more about computers, I might be able to pinpoint the issue. But look here. In the top right corner, 1316 was displayed in black digits. Oh, one o'clock already. I guess I did sleep for over two hours. Ye did you hear that? Huh? I didn't hear anything. We warily walked to the hallway A door and looked through it. I think I heard something in the lobby. Seeing how cautious he was, I approached it myself. Nobody was there. Still phased by the imposing shutter, Atsuki walked forward a little. Did I imagine it? Both the other doors were shut. Atsuki circled the room at a slow pace and stopped to smell the air. Then he continued to circle with a frown. There's this open drawer. It wasn't like this before, was it? I walked up to him. Behind the reception desk, one of the drawers wasn't fully closed. Oh no, I didn't think so. We looked inside and confirmed that there was nothing in it. Then, Atsuki proceeded to open all the other drawers. There's only papers in a few of them. It's strange, I honestly can't be sure it wasn't opened before. Something else we'll have to ask. I'll walk into what hallway B. Atsuki noticed I still hadn't moved. Hmm. What's up? Come back, you hear this faint buzz, right? Yes, it's coming from below, right? It's the boiler. I was thinking it must be really annoying to work at this chair with this constant noise. But then I thought that it might not have been as noticeable as before. He didn't go to the mechanical room, but the rest of us did. I'm not sure it was audible from up here. Oh. He looked at the door he'd not yet gone through. Actually, I remember beginning to hear the sound as we were going down the stairs. As soon as he opened it, the intensity of the sound strengthened. There was no light on the stairs and they immediately made a sharp turn. You think the boiler got louder then? Oh, that's not what I meant. After a few steps forward, I confirmed my assumption. The short door leading to the mechanical room was partially open. It's this door. It was shut when we came, so the sound didn't reach us. I don't remember if we closed it when we left. Ah, I see. So at most it means that someone went down here. But I'm sure they searched for us in Naomi. It's, it's fine. We began descending the stairs. If he'd really heard a sound come from this lobby, it was possible someone was under us. After widening the gap of the door, he stepped into the basement room, which was constantly beset by the buzzing noise. I stopped behind him, waiting for my eyes to adjust to the illumination the faint light bulb offered. But even when that happened, the darkness still reigned. Atsuki started to walk slowly in order to comprehend where he was. I don't think there's anyone here. I could discern a few pieces of furniture that Atsuki had moved aside, and the walls closest to me. Strangely, I felt relieved to hear that nobody was with us, even though we wanted to find the others. Wait, no. Hmm? Look. I thought we were about to leave, but that wasn't the case. I approached the dark blob Atsuki was next to, until it was revealed to be a pile of chairs. Behind it, on the floor, was an abnormal, weak glow. The Sekamaya, the gemstone we come to see, and which possessed a mysterious power, immobile on the floor. It resembled the ceiling room. Sai was right. Katai had the key, and he used it while we were in the attic. Yeah. I'm not sure why he'd hide the Sekamaya, though. I don't think it makes any sense. He'd have better places to hide it, like his locker. You think so? We could force him to open it at any time, and it would be easily found after the exit opens. Atsuki crouched next to the Sekamaya and stared at it. Are you going to use it? We don't know how long it's been here for, so it might not be a good idea. What do you mean? Well, if, you time, if your time travel depends on how long it's spent out of the cabinet, you can go really far back. Oh, hmm. I see. Once again, he went quiet. I had no idea what he was thinking, but I knew I didn't like him. Sai had told me not to let him get his hands on the Sekamaya, and I had no idea why. All I knew was that he kept some of his thoughts to himself, and that I felt he might have lied to me. He'd been thinking something up, that I was sure of. Not only because I knew him, but also because he'd admitted it to me. For once, the silence wasn't entirely pure. The mechanical room's noise was pervasive. Minutes after staring at the gemstone, Atsuki's hand hovered over to it. What are you doing? It's hot, the air around it. Oh, that's weird. When I touched it earlier, I felt a zap for an instant before I teleported. I have no idea how, but it heated up really fast. When I was holding the cushion from below, it went, cold, went from cold to hot in a minute. I didn't know how to answer, but the bizarre situation sunk in even further. What the hell was the Sekamara? 
And what was it doing with us? Are you going to use it to change the past? I don't know. The answer reinforced everything I'd been feeling. He couldn't not know. He knew exactly what his goal was, and I did too. So why was he acting so reserved? But he didn't flesh out his answer, opting to resume his silence. Even though I couldn't see his face, his slow breathing told me all I needed to know. I might have pushed the issue further if someone hadn't hit me. When did he teleport? Teleported. After mentioning the time, he touched the second wire, a glaring contradiction that I'd previously ignored reared his head. You travelled to the attic, right? Yes. He's lying. There's no way you travelled to the attic. Did he not realise that it doesn't make sense? He said he travelled 20 minutes to the past, at that point all of us were in the attic as well. That's fine depending on where he appeared. It's not like he erased his past self, right? So if he appeared in one of those rooms, after they'd been investigated, they, we would have seen him. But this is a big problem. Where in the attic did you appear? In the kitchen, and I'm pretty sure that's because I went there before we left. It's something I was trying to figure out earlier. Uh, no, he's lying. The only part of the attic where he could have appeared would have been the staircase at the entrance. Every other place doesn't make sense. When we searched the whole floor, we made sure nobody could have sneaked past us. Katai waited in the corner of the hallway, and Akuto in the living room. As Edna said, 20 minutes before the time he, he, he travelled, all of us are still in the attic, and we're about to leave. Atsuki who had travelled didn't deny that. Couldn't to him, he appeared in the kitchen, and then we left. That's not right. For some reason the elevator started functioning again, and Sai called it. Then him, Akuto, Edna, and Isla went to the crystal pool room. However, Katai and Atsuki and I left through the main door and locked it. Atsuki, after appearing in the kitchen, would not have been able to leave the attic. He couldn't have left through the staircase before us, because there were no footprints that started from the kitchen. Then when we left, we locked the main door, but most importantly, we learned that when the three of us arrived at the crystal floor, Katai saw the door of the elevator slightly open. How does he not understand what he's saying is impossible? The elevator remained open on the crystal floor until the time after he'd already reunited with us. That means that if he'd been in the attic, he couldn't have called it. It couldn't have happened. When we were in the security room, the elevator was still open, and it must have been either Sai or Naomi who finally closed it. Could it be that it wasn't the group of four who left the door open? Is it possible Atsuki used the elevator immediately after them? And it was actually him who didn't close it properly? I don't think he would have had enough time to call it back and go all the way down, and it's very unlikely the others wouldn't have seen him. It's even possible we would have heard the elevator going up and down from the offices. So how did he leave the attic? It's not possible he couldn't have. Both methods were unavailable. The only way he could have could would have been with the key that I had. Even if somehow he got out, maybe by Naomi unlocking the door, he should have mentioned that it was unlocked when it shouldn't have been. This is confirmation that he's lying. I became aware of the smell surrounding him, the one which almost seamlessly blended in. Its cold sensation had persisted in my nostrils since the first time we encountered it, so it hadn't been easy to notice. It had strengthened the game. Alright, I'll touch it. There's one thing I absolutely have to confirm. And what is that? Whether or not the past can be changed. You think it can't? I don't know. I wasn't able to change anything last time. I have no idea how this will work. I'll disappear from this room and reappear somewhere else. If I try to change what I experienced, I don't know how the universe will react. Perhaps you won't notice any difference and I'll branch the world. Maybe this reality will instantly morph into the one I'm making. Despite how ridiculous he sounded, all he was saying was that he was about to leave me there, that perhaps I'd stay in this world he'd disappeared from while he'd go on to find his better reality. It was annoying, and giving everything, given everything else going on in my head, I simply shrugged. He would leave me behind at the second mile, which would be a great chance to fulfill Sai's request. I was going to say that if the past can't be changed, I'd be above the start stairs after I disappear, but there's no way that'll be the case. If I was there right now, I'd try to make a loud noise to change the past, but I have no clue what's about to happen. He didn't think about it further. Finally, the hand that had been teasing contact for so long dropped to touch the shining gem. Instantly, Atsuki's outline disappeared. And with that, we definitely need to wrap this one up because I let it go on a little bit long, but I wanted to make sure that conversation was done before we ended it. Uh, interesting, interesting. Atsuki is seeming real dodgy this time, which is weird because he was, apart from kind of stupid, um, <laughs> he was quite reliable in the first one, at the very, at the very least. But uh, I guess we shall see. Obviously his plan is to uh, get Mia back. That's what they've all been thinking about. And that's what he was talking about at the end of uh, Chapter 1. When it didn't seem like uh, Shiroi wanted to go back to save Mia. She just wanted it to be over, you know. And he couldn't believe it. But uh, 
This is definitely his crusade. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for hanging out with me and I'll see you in the next one.